Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to the Scottish Parliament and to the Festival of Politics. My name's Kenny Farkerson. I'm a political columnist on The Times newspaper based in Scotland. The Times has been a supporter of the Festival of Politics for many years now, and we're very proud to be so. Um, it's my pleasure, great pleasure, to welcome you here today and to introduce you to a fantastic panel on one of the defining issues of the moment internationally. Um, we have three very eminent uh, academics for you. I'm going to introduce you to them uh, now. A um, couple of um, uh, housekeeping things. We're here for an hour and a half. Nice lunchtime uh, visit to build up a hunger or a thirst, depending on your point of view. Nice live discussion. It's going to be an interactive thing for any young people in the audience. This, this is like a podcast, <laughs> but the people are actually here. <laughs> And you get to speak to them and ask questions, you know. So, um, so <laughs> it's live interactive. You just proved that. <laughs> um, so uh, I, we're going to talk for an hour, but I'm going to make sure that there's half an hour at least for you guys to kind of get involved and to ask questions um, of our panel. So today we have on my left, your right, Professor Peter Jackson. Peter's Chair in Global Security at the University of Glasgow, and he's also Executive Director of the Scottish Council on Global Affairs, a very interesting new organisation. Um, he's taught in many universities, including Cambridge, Yale, Strathclyde and Sorbonne. He also edits, uh, has edited uh, the leading journal in the field of intelligence studies, which is called Intelligence and National Security. Then we have uh, Professor Luke uh, March, who's Professor of Post-Soviet and Comparative Politics at the University of Edinburgh. He works on Russian nationalism and foreign policy, the radical left in Europe and Russia, and left-wing populism. His latest publication is co-authored. It's the Palgrave Handbook of the Radical Left. <coughs> and finally, Dr. Samantha May is a lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of Aberdeen. She's the author of Islamic Charity, How Charitable Giving Became Seen as a Threat to National Security. And her research interests include the intertwining of religion, politics, economics, uh, especially in the context of political Islam. So, three very on-point people for you today. So, um, a, I thought, first of all, to kick off, if we could just first things first, and have some clarity about what we're talking about. How would you define political strongmen? I'm going to ask each of the three panellists just to kind of talk a little bit about what we're talking about here. Who are they, and what are their telltale, telltale characteristics? Peter. Ah, thanks. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It's lovely to be here. Uh, one observation that comes to mind that I think may be developed a little later on is that they are all men. <laughs> And it's very interesting looking around uh, the political landscape in Europe, I suppose, and that women who have our power, who have been in power recently, uh, have tended overwhelmingly to, be, to stick up for democracy and for uh, the rule of law. And I suppose if there's something that uh, unites all of the strong, man that we're, strong men that we're likely to be speaking about today. It's, I think, their engagement with the politics of grievance and the politics of uh, opposition, opposition to uh, the kind of democratic, liberal, capitalist world order that emerged. It's often called the rules-based international order that emerged after the Second World War, or in fact during the Second World War, and then was imposed with increasing confidence or arrogance, enthusiasm by Western powers after the end of the Cold War. And in different ways, all of the strong men uh, that will concern us today are opposed to this order. And I think probably I'll let someone else have a go at definition because there's a lot more to say than that. I think that was a cue for, for, for you, Luke. What, do you want to take this on from there? Okay, yeah, and um, 
Thanks for everyone for being here. I'm in a suit that I last wore before the pandemic, so I feel a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, does this, does this fit anymore? Um, but no, I think that's a really good start. Um, I think there are women supporters who are important behind strong men, and there have been occasional strong leaders like Eva Perron. But even those women, it's part of the, the, part of the image is extremely macho. And one thinks, uh, or it's traditional, one thinks of um, Sarah Palin, if you, if you remember the governor of Alaska, a vice presidential candidate, said, what's the difference between a pit bull and a hockey mum? Lipstick. So it's a kind of very aggressive, very aggressive kind of macho. And there's Marjorie Taylor Greene and all these gun-toting Republicans at the moment. But it is led largely by men. And um, it's this macho image is based on a very kind of strong, kind of virulent kind of sexist masculinity that's kind of taboo breaking. They, they act as people, the strength also you might question about what, what they actually achieve in terms of good things for their country and uh, that goes for Trump, that goes for Putin who, who's, who's more the, the person I focus on. I mean what he's doing now is likely to leave Russia in a much worse position than when he started but it's this, this presentation of, of kind of absolute virility kind of uh, um, and it is very gendered as well. I mean uh, Putin started the, um, you know, he, imminent kind of indication of where he was going to go was uh, with a conversation with Macron in September, in uh, February, just before, when he was talking about why Zelensky, you know, the, the president of Ukraine, why he didn't want to agree to what Russia was doing with the uh, Minsk Accords, which were about um, kind of setting up a Russian protectorate in Ukraine. And he said this phrase, he said, Nravitsa ni Nravitsa tepi maya krasavitsa, which basically is a rape joke. joke you know? uh, it basically means, um, like it or not, uh, do your duty, my beauty. And it's also from a song, and the, the woman in question is also a corpse. So it's offensive on so many levels. It's basically like, we'll do what we like, we like to you, Ukraine, and an indication of the... So there's a, there's a threat of violence behind that as well. Mm. Um, but I, did, I very much, again, I've spoken for good while in terms of introduction. It's, it's about being the outsider, presenting yourself as the outsider, yeah, a, a kind of anti-establishment to, to the, not necessarily within the political system, but to the order. And this kind of non-PC taboo-breaking mm. image is quite good for the media as well, and that's one thing. It you know, it's kind of picks up on scandals and, and, and kind of events and, um, and things that kind of have resident, resonance in the, in the media. Um, but it's, it, the maleness of it really needs to be focused on as well. Mm -hmm. Samantha, what would you add to that? Firstly, thank you all for being here, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I agree with both of my fellow um, panel discussions about what they've said so far, and I think what's coming through is there's not really a single definition of what is a strong man, but there are tendencies, and the masculinity is something that I would actually like to focus on, but it's not just the gender. Gender is interwoven with race, sexuality, and a host of other things that weaponize gender, race, and sexuality. Strong men tend to say they are speaking and acting on behalf of the real people. And the real people, in this sense, becomes exclusionary group. The real people are ultra-nationalists. In the sort of US context or Western Europe context, the real people are understood to be white, they are understood to be heterosexual, able-bodied, and usually masculine. Women, when they are talked about, the real people, the real women, are viewed as positively as mothers of the nation. Whereas the other, so it creates the other, this idea of us versus them, and the real people versus the non-real people. The other is often racialized, gendered, and seen as sexually aggressive. So let's think about, say, Trump's idea of when he spoke about Mexicans as bad hombres. They're male. They are also criminals and rapists. And they're therefore coming to rape and harm the women, the real women who are white and Christian. And in the short answer to the actual question, is it a threat to democracy? It's certainly a threat to liberal, plural democracy. So it really depends on what you think democracy is as well. But I'll leave it there. No, that's a good answer. The, the, I suspect the reason this topic is on the agenda for the Festival of Politics is Russia and Ukraine. 
And so uh, I think we should spend a bit of time looking at that. And um, so, look, you've got a particular focus on, 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 on Russia. To what extent is the war in Ukraine a consequence of Putin's personality, his character as a strong man? Um, I think it's immensely, it's immensely relevant. There is a sense in which the Russian elite believe more or less the same things generally about the world, and they have a sense of grievance about the world. But I think if we look through um, Russian and Soviet history, then the character of the leader really matters. You know, all of the communist leaders, be they Stalin, Lenin, Khrushchev, you know, they had quite a rigid ideology, but their effect on their countries was, 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 was actually very different. I mean, there were was, was certain continuities, and a lot of those things are things that are relevant now in terms of kind of brutality and, uh, and terror and those kind, of, those kind of things. But I, I don't think that we can confidently say if it had been another leader that this would have happened, I think, because a lot of the people within Russia themselves, even in the elite uh, at the time, were, were, don't seem to have been prepared for it, and it was prepared in a very small uh, group of people outside the normal channels. After it happened, they kind of fell into line. Um, but it does come down partly to his psychology. That is within the broader conduct of, um, of Russia's strategic culture, which um, Peter might want uh, uh, might want to talk about as well in terms of how Russia has traditionally seen the world, but uh, and that is that dictates kind of ag uh, aggression and suspicion towards the West, subordinate status for Ukraine, those kind of things. But actually, in terms of invading it, um, that's not ne that doesn't necessarily follow and wasn't necessarily predicted from what Putin had done before. And we don't really know an awful lot about his psychology in terms of people who said he's ill. Um, he doesn't look well to me, but I wouldn't want to speculate about that. Boris Yeltsin was, looked very ill for a very long time and lived for eight years after he stopped being president, so we can't really hope for that. Um, he's, been, he's, been, he's been secluded. Um, he doesn't see anyone. It's also partly to do with how... It's, it, a lot to do with how he governs and who he listens to and the fact that you can't really bring bad news to him anymore, so he, he didn't... He, he has no real... Um, kind of accurate information about how his military is doing, or possibly even about his society. And it's an open question at the moment, does he even know much about the conduct of the war? And, you know, we, we focus very much on the Ukrainian side, and, you know, this happens to Russia. Um, you know, the um, a base was blown up in Crimea the other day, and that looks very bad for Russia. Yeah, it does in term, military terms, but does Putin see it that way? Mm. I don't think we know. I don't think we even know if he, think, he thinks that this... It hasn't gone quite to plan. But he is looking at a longer game as well, which is, uh, is about settling scores, trying to get Russia back into back noticed. I don't think that's going to work for him, but it, doesn't, it means that um, it's, a com it's basically a combination of the culture of the elite and his, his personality. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the latter really dictates timing uh, and the, the actual evolution of what's mm -hmm. going on. And he's taking personal charge for a few decisions here and there as well. Yeah. Peter, how important is an accurate understanding of Putin's personality and, and outlook. How important is that at this point as we look to the conduct of the, the war and more importantly how it could possibly be brought to an end and, and how, 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 you, how you, what the end game is and how, you, 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 how important Putin's personality is to that? Well that, that is I suppose a question that doesn't cause me to be very optimistic mm -hmm. because I do think that Putin saw this moment as a moment to assert Russia's uh, dominance over an, a part of the world that had long been considered part of the Russian world or the, the Mon Slav. I don't know the Russian word for this, but there is a term, isn't there, Luke? You know, the, the Russian world, the Russian sphere. And I think he saw it as a good moment because he saw the West as being divided with you know, the politics of, of uh, Brexit in the UK and, and in the EU as being weakening both parties. I think he saw also uh, problems in the United States and saw Biden as an old and weak president. And he also saw the future and he thought, if I don't act now, I may not, we, Russia may not get a better moment to reassert itself. I don't think he wants to rebuild the Soviet Union, but I think, and I, I think I'm drawing on Luke partly in saying this, uh, he does look back to 
an era even before the Soviet Union of Russian greatness and thinks that that's Russia's birthright, it's Russia's rightful place in the world. And it was a moment where, you know, uh, energy prices were high as a result of the, the post-COVID global, global uh, recovery being uh, probably more robust than popular. Russia also, than, than anticipated, Russia also had a large uh, war chest of foreign exchange reserves at the, at the time, which is, I think, not as, as large now as some people say. And he thought, he, thought, he thought, I think if I don't act now, okay, I'm not going to be able to achieve this aim. And part of that aim was also, I think, to try and challenge that order that I mentioned, that post, that rules-based liberal capitalist order uh, that's at least from the post-Cold War. And it hasn't gone to plan, but now, partly because I think Putin realizes that a lot of his grip on power is to do with his image as a strong man, as someone in control, as someone in whom Russians can have confidence that if Russia is humiliated in Ukraine, the way it's been basically since the beginning of the war, uh, that this is a threat to his personal place, the personal grip on power. And this leads me, unfortunately, to be quite pessimistic about an end game in the foreseeable future that, uh, that, that allows Russia to cease its special operation with some level of dignity. You know, if it's thrown out of the Crimea, as well as the Donbass, and this is, I think, what most, most Western observers are, are anticipating or at least hoping for, well, this is a massive humiliation for Putin's regime. Sorry if I've gone on too no, long. No, no, that's, that's, you, you haven't, that's good. Samantha, one of your specialities is where politics and religion combine. And in, in Russia, we've seen um, an alliance between the Orthodox Church and, and, and Putin. And how important is that for the strong man to be seen as, you know, with the, the uh, in this case, a cross behind them? I think it can feed into that romanticised nostalgia of great times before of Tsarist Russia, or a moral value that gives legitimacy to what these strong men are saying that isn't part of the established political norms. So if you're going away from the established political norms like strong men tend to do, you need some other form of legitimacy. And here's some interpretations of religion, and I am saying some interpretations of religion because there are various ones can help sustain that legitimacy. And we can see it in not just Trump's presidency, but also the Republicans turn towards the sort of so-called Christian right, which has helped to legitimize many of their policies. And so I think it's got a, an awful lot to, to say and has repercussions on an awful lot of other things. I think it also feeds into, say, the um, current attack on reproductive rights of women within the United States that aligns with some of the sort of Christian, so-called Christian right um, I'm prerogatives, but also feeds into this idea of threat and the politics of demographics, which is where we get gender and race coming back into it again. There is a fear that the once nostalgic, brilliant um, past is now threatened by the other. Whether, um, and this return to religion is a return back to these traditional past glories and values that are threatened by whoever the other is and the other is constructed based on the particular environment and context. So what am I trying to say here? In terms of the demographic, the politics of demo um, demographics, for instance, I'm going to use Modi in India. Um, Modi... Um, has in India there's this idea of love jihad, the idea that the Hindu majority are threatened by the Muslim majority because Muslims are having more babies than Hindus. So love jihad is this preposterous narrative that sexually aggressive Muslims are you know, trying to get with um, Hindu women who are pure and part of the real nation to overrun the demographics and take over India. And this has repercussions in the US as well in terms of reper 
reproduction rights in that there's this idea that white America is being overtaken by people of colour, whether they're Latinx or, or blacks or Muslims, which is the worst. Um, it's not. That was me <laughs> lying, by the way, <laughs> just in case anyone takes that out of context. Just somebody's transcribing yeah. this. <laughs> exactly. Um, and this attack on reproductive rights has so little to do with religion, but much more to do with the demographics of trying to keep America white. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to stop abortions, the best way to do it is to stop people getting pregnant, not to stop the health of women. Which I, by the way, propose that that means that all men should have temporary reversible vasectomies rather than attack my body. Thank you. Yeah. Good this is so interesting, Samantha, because my son was in North Carolina. Well, I was there too uh, with his basketball team, and they were staying with families from the same church, and it was an evangelical church. And three of them had to go to church on one of the Sundays we were there, where they were made to pray for the success of the anti-abortion leg uh, legislation wow. that was before the Supreme, the move, well, judgment before the Supreme Court. So here are these three kids from, from the west of Scotland, never even thought about these issues probably any, seriously, being forced, at least, you know, being pressured to pray for something. And it, it, that really gave me some insight into the kind of network behind the Make America Great movement in Trump. Sorry, mm. but no, no, that's good. Um, and I'm, I'm, as, as our as our American ambassador on the stage, uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian, Canadian. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh God, what a terrible faux pas. <laughs> forgive me, forgive me. Um, the um, um, I'm interested, Peter, what you make of the um, the North American right. See what I did there. Um, a um, um, uh, learning lessons from the strong men of, from the rest of the world. And I'm looking particularly at Hungary. I mean, the, uh, um, a, the CPAC, which uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a kind of uh, a, 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 like a, a conservative conference of uh, American, the American right. One of the hub is a kind of a, a traveling circus. One of them was held in, in Budapest this year. Um, and there was a large number of people from the American right there. And, uh, and Orban in Hungary has been the inspiration for much of the policy program of people like Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida and potentially a future president of the United States. Um, a, and some of his policies, uh, particularly the one that's called Don't Say Gay, uh, which is like a American Section 28 about what you can and can't say in schools about questions of sexuality, was just lifted from the Orban program in Hungary and implemented in 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 Florida. I was just wondering what what you made of the 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 transfer of ideas and the idea that the the European and global strongmen were importing ideas to the American right. I mean, I think it's really interesting because so much of the, the kind of wider movement that's based on cultural conservatism, nostalgic nationalism, which I think has come out already quite a lot, and, and racism, frankly, and I'm happy to have that recorded, is ironically drawing on a global network. The anti-globalists have a global network of kind of an exchange of ideas and political, ta political tactics and, and strategies that they share. And Steve Bannon jets around, you know, being for all, for all intents and purposes a cosmopolitan elite, you know, going to Hong Kong and all over Europe and, and, and uh, the UK, uh, basically, you know, sharing ideas, sharing, sharing strategies. And that's kind of a really interesting irony, mm. you know. And his ideas, which, and, and the vilification of George Soros, really interesting, mm. part of this as well, especially in Hungary, mm. you know, where I think in 2017 there was an election in Hungary where, you know, there was a picture of George Soros was plastered around Hungary saying, to, with, him, with a grin on his face saying, don't let him keep smiling, you know, vote for, mm. vote Orban, Orban. And, uh, there is this kind of weird paradox in that 
There's a global marketplace of far-right, racist, racist hyper-nationalist, backward-looking in some ways, uh, 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 I suppose, ideologues. Mm -hmm. And very interestingly, even though they will often invoke the past, they use social media incredibly effectively. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, the, the skills that are transferred through this network. They use social media very effectively to speak directly to their audience. Mm -hmm. I find mm -hmm. it really interesting, but again, a li a little more than a little depressing, especially from, I'm from Western Canada. And where I'm from is the most conservative part of Canada, hands down. And a lot of people that I'm still friends with on Facebook were part of, I don't know if you heard of the, the trucker's convoy that, mm. that traveled across mm. Canada and shut the capital down for, and I, I'm part of their conversations. I don't intervene in them. I just, I'm an observer or a stalker, you might say. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a bit crazy. Yeah. But they are influenced by the imagery and the tactics of Make America Great, uh, which in turn is, I mean, Nigel Farage is one of the first people with whom Trump met after the, mm. this is a real network, yeah. you know. Luke, I'm interested in um, the, the people that you study on the, on the American left, and the, on, on, on the left of politics. Um, are the, the, the bogeymen, and I, 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 took, I, I noted um, DeSantis in a, a speech earlier this year, if we're looking for a definition of who the right hate, it's, um, he talked about the, um, the horsemen of a left-wing apocalypse, and this is, this is quite good to tick them off, it's a critical race theory, um, Faustian dystopia, which I take to mean overreach of government or things like COVID, uncontrolled immigration, big tech, Left-wing oligarchs, which is a great phrase. Uh, Soros-funded prosecutors, with all the um, dog whistle around that. And transgender athletes, um, which quite is, list, yeah. is quite, a, it's quite, a, quite a list. But you know, the, 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 the left in all those forms. I mean, the, 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 a provocative question. Um, is, is, the, the, is the left doing itself any favours? In, uh, in resisting the strongman agenda? That's a big question. Um, yeah. The, you started actually by, by saying that one of my expertise is, uh, is left-wing populism, and we haven't talked about it, and there's, there's, there's good reason, because they're not, as, they're not as popular, they're not as successful. There are examples, there's regional specificities in Latin America, um, but in Europe and elsewhere, they are not, they're not quite as successful. Um, and there are many reasons for this, and it's, it's partly to do with the kind of anti-imperialist heritage of, of Latin America. But one gen really general thing you can say about the left across, and this includes the communist left, across time and space, where it has been most successful is where it downplays doctrine to some degree without, um, and, and engages with identity, be that... And, and some, sometimes that's... Uh, kind of um, ethnic minority identity, etc. But it engages with a question about national identity and doesn't kind of shy away. And we have these discussions in, in Britain about you know, whether the Labour Party should use the flag and that kind of thing, and, and you know, whether it should tie itself up with Britishness or Scottishness and that kind of thing. But generally speaking, you know, the left in, uh, in the past was, particularly the communist left, was very, very doctrinaire, uh, kind of Leninist. And where it was successful electorally, and, and uh, it, it actually shied away from that a little bit, and in, let's say, Iceland was a country that people don't know about, but Italy, the strong communist party there. And where it's been successful in Europe, um, to some degree, in Spain and France, is where it's actually junked a lot of the traditional left-wing um, uh, kind of slogans and taken on kind of new colours uh, and new media and those kind of things. And I'm thinking of Podemos in Spain mm -hmm. and um, Unbowed France, La France Insoumise in, in, um, in France. And there it actually, um, they, they, they speak kind of about patriotism. Um, they speak about um, kind of having a strong national identity and their national traditions. And, and this is a diff difficult balance for the left. And well, again, what I'm thinking, it comes straight into my head about um, Miliband's kind of mug in 2015 about the Labour Party kind of supporting restrictions on immigrants. There are some things that are kind of 
inimical to, to, to the, the left-wing position, and probably should be, you know, in terms of... Um, the, for the left, it's a question of how much you deal with these identity issues, and the, the realities of people who are uh, kind of left behind, who are, and again, we've talked about uh, groups who are struggling. There's all kinds of reasons for this. A, a lot of the strongman impetus comes from the defence of, of, of people who are lo feel that they're losing out, whether or not they are. There's always this silent majority that is not actually silent and not always the majority, so that, mm. that's sometimes a bit of a myth. So I think it's dangerous ground for them sometimes. Um, I think there's the, the challenge for the left is always to keep true to, to some of their values. You don't suddenly, as a left-winger, go, um, we're going to restrict all immigration or we're going to support racism or those kind of things. But it's about actually tackling some of those issues and not having kind of reflex sloganistic positions, which I've studied the left. I sometimes, it's, it's sometimes, um, and, the, and the left is in knots now about NATO. You know, and, the, and Ukraine's a good example. The, certainly, and when I say the left, I'm not talk, necessarily talking about social democratic centre left, because they've always been kind of Atlanticists. But some of the, some of the more populist um, kind of radical or far left have traditionally, and they, they've been kind of a little bit negligent towards Putin. They say, well, we don't like him, but actually we're more focused on American imperialism. Um, but it's actually getting away from the, 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 the... And we can talk about this in questions, but NATO is a reason for what happened, but it's not the main one. It's mm. not about security. It's about empire. It's about... Mm. And again, I, 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 taking Peter's point, it's not about... It's not about Putin marching his troops across Europe and taking over and re reconstituting the Soviet Union. It's about, from their perspective, they see that what they're doing is defensive. Mm. It's like we're taking back things which were taken from us. Um, and it's not necessarily um, like Central Asia. Ukraine is special to them, and I'm not saying that it, it should be. The Ukrainians definitely have a, have a voice in that and should about being the younger brother. But, but it's a, it, I, I do think sometimes the left doesn't help itself. But um, if we're talking about democracy generally, the, the, there's always this dilemma of how far you go to meet the strong men. Mm. Um, and you can try and ban them. And that quite often doesn't work. And actually, um, although there are many examples of where strong men should have been stopped at the word go, and you know, Hitler, Mussolini, and Trump were kind of co-opted, and people thought we could tame them. Boris Johnson, not really a strong man in the same way, but remember, Dominic Cummings was saying, look. He's going to be a disaster, but as long as he has the right people around him, he'll be fine. <laughs> it never works. So, so that kind of thing doesn't work. Um, but if, traditionally, if the left tries to ape the right and kind of says, actually, we're going to become anti-immigrant, um, you know, we're going to, to really go there, then the electorate goes, actually, we want the original, not the fake. You know, we'll mm. go for the people who, are, who are really, really mean it. So it's, it's a real dilemma of actually trying to engage with the reasons. And when, when you come up with voters who are who are anti-immigrant, um, it's not shutting them down. You obviously have, have to have a position on racism. Um, but it's understanding why they feel that way and trying to persuade them that actually the solutions aren't, aren't in necessarily. Um, like the, the impacts of, let's say, immigration mm. um, may be misconstrued or uh, are real, but actually cutting, stopping people coming in this country are, um, is not the solution, but that is, involves a long conversation, and it doesn't mm. really fit the kind of politics that we're quite often in, which is uh, send them to Rwanda, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, it's immoral, but you know, and I think actually you should start by saying it's immoral because that's a short. Yeah. You, uh, with the practicalities of it, once you get into the practicalities, people are going to say, let's send them back. Just don't, you know. So that's the difficulty in this kind of thing. And the left is sometimes very long-winded as well, yeah. which I've reflected a little bit. But no, I was, I was good. Yeah. I, I, I was a much more full answer than I was expecting. So thank you for that. Samantha, one of your um, specialities is the Muslim world, and I was wondering whether or not the, the trajectory of the strong man in the Muslim world was, was different to what we've been talking about when we were talking about the West. Now, you mentioned Modi from, in the Hindu context, but the, the, in, in, in the Muslim world, in the, in the, especially in the Middle East, what are the characteristics we're talking about and what are the differences, what are the similarities? As I said sort of earlier, the way that strong men manifest themselves really depends on context. Yeah. And I personally don't like the Muslim world because we've got one world. <laughs> we all live in it. Um, so there's different ways that the strong man can manifest in places like the Middle East or Muslim majority countries because there's very few states that are actually Islamic states. And most are just Muslim majority that are secular and based on very similar systems as our own. 
What we do see, however, is obviously where strong men in the non-Muslim majority world tend to isolate Muslims as one of the main threats. In Muslim majority states, then they create a different kind of other. And often it isn't, it isn't things like look at choosing a different religion. It's often internal. So Sunni dominated states may target Shias rather than target a different faith. So that, I think that's one of the things that comes out. If we're looking at Turkey and Erdogan, for instance, going back to the demographics of um, the politics of demographics, um, Erdogan argued that you know, Sunni Muslims should have lots and lots of children to make sure the balance against the Shias. So there, there tends to be a oversimplification in Western Europe of what Muslim peoples are as one homogenous group that all gets on against the rest, which is far from it. Even within the UK, there's such a diversity of Muslim communities. And I think that's where the strong men within Muslim majority states kind of end up targeting other interpretations of Islam rather than other faiths or but it also tends to be genderized as well. That mm -hmm. masculine, strong man, the nation is muscular. And that weaves into a similar, similar pattern that we see across, whether it's in the Muslim majority world or elsewhere. This idea of the male strong protector that obviously needs to protect us vulnerable women. Mm -hmm. And this leads to another irony and paradox in that if women need protected, who do we need protected from? Mm. You know, we know in, for instance, in the UK right now, the levels of aggression and violence against women are ongoing. There is a genuine grievance here. There is a genuine feel, there is something genuine going on, but it's not caused by the other. If we look at the statistics, women are most likely to be harmed, whether sexually, psychologically, or physically, by people they know. Mm. It's by their family members, by their friends and their colleagues, not by the other. But the other creates a very useful scapegoat. So there is genuine grievance, but nobody's addressing the real problems, they're, they're putting it elsewhere. And as I say, the irony is that when, whether it's Muslim majority world or else, when they project this idea of men need to be a strong protector and women need to be protected, we often need to be protected from the very people who say they are protecting yeah. us. Yeah. yeah, good point. Um, I'd like to bring it to a far more personal um, and person uh, about. When I, I've been covering politics for thirty years, and um, and I'm not particularly interested in politics. Uh, I have to say, I'm interested. I'm interested in people, uh, and but politics is a wonderful lens through which to examine how people work. And how you know that how you take a, a, an ordinary person, you put them in a, an extraordinary position with extraordinary power, and how their 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 thought processes work, how, how their instincts manifest themselves, and what they do, and it's endlessly fascinating because people are endlessly fascinating, and in the context of our discussion on the strong men, I mean something that, that that's at the heart of all the people we're talking about, from Modi to Erdogan to 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 to, to Trump, is and like it or not, charisma. There's a kind of, there's a personal appeal. And you know, charisma is very difficult to define. You know, you, 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 the minute you, you know somebody's got charisma, but it's very hard to explain why they have it, but you can tell in a second whether or not they have it when they walk into a room. How, how important is, is that, that, I'm gonna call it a quality, personal quality in what we're talking about, Peter? Uh, well, I think probably in order to be effective, first of all, in, within a movement, mm -hmm. you have to have charisma. And then that charisma has to translate slightly outside the movement in order for the movement to grow and, mm -hmm. and gain power. And I think probably it, it's difficult to, to say with certainty, but I I think it can be overstated, Kenny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't find Vladimir Putin very charismatic. But apparently, in person, he can project real menace. Yeah. 
yeah, real kind of seem very threatening, and people attribute that to his past as a, as a, as a KGB officer, and he was, I think, head of the FSB for a while. But that's a different personal quality than the ability to take hold of a room mm -hmm. and paint a picture of a, a vision of the future that you're offering and get everyone in that room behind you. And I've rarely seen it in person at that level. Bill Clinton, I was at a, a kind of a, a small town rally in Maine of all places for Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton spoke and there was a room about maybe about three times the size of this and everyone in that room felt a personal commitment and stake in Bill Clinton's vision. And then I thought how dangerous that, that can be. But I don't see it in Putin. I don't really see it in Erdogan, but I could be wrong. Mm. I haven't seen them in person. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know, it's tricky. People like Mussolini had it. Hitler was this kind of very unassuming uh, figure until he got up on a stage and then he transformed. There was a famous, mm -hmm. there was a famous uh, line from Anthony Eden's memoirs where he, or, or maybe it was Halifax's memoirs where he thought that Hitler was one of the doormen and went to hand him his coat <laughs> when the first time they met in, in, mm. in, uh, in Munich in 1938. And, uh, and yet put him in front of a, a group of thousands of people and he was mm. this diabolical, mm. charismatic figure who just had a genius for figuring out what people wanted to hear and for identifying the weaknesses in his mm. enemies. Sorry, I, I yeah. probably haven't answered your question. No, but, that, uh, uh, but, I'm uh, glad you mentioned Clinton because if I may allow the chairman's prerogative to tell a wee story, that, that um, Joe Klein, the great American journalist who wrote Primary Colours, um, he wrote a book uh, about Clinton. And the introduction, he described following Clinton on his, uh, the, the first uh, primary um, and being away from home for, for, for many months on the trail. But uh, when he was on holiday once, um, Clinton, Clinton was coming to where he lived, the city he lived in, so he took his son along to listen to Clinton speak. And Clinton clocked him at the back of the, of, the, of, the, of the hall. And at the end, before he did anything, he came back and he, he knelt down to Joe Klein's son and said, um, I'm the reason your daddy has been away from home all these months. And, uh, uh, and so it's my fault you haven't seen him very much. But let me tell you, he talks about you every day. <laughs> and that's just, you know, and, and now, now you, can, you can say that shtick you can say it's insincerity, but what it is is a very, very acute understanding of how people work. Um, uh, I was just wondering, Samantha, about, about you know, personality and the personal, and I, I, again, I hesitate with this word qualities in, in what we're doing. You know, I, people have got to either want to identify with this person or see something in inverted commas good in, in that person. I kind of agree with Peter in that it might not necessarily be an innate charisma, but it is a skillful use of, well, those, the strong men have a skillful use of understanding what a certain segment of the population wants to hear. Mm. And social media has been fantastic at that mm. because there just really isn't the censorship and the established norms that. Um, are usual around sort of traditional politics. And I think that's one of the things about strong men. They claim to speak common sense. When they do speak, they're very thin on details and very seldom actually provide any evidence. But to a certain segment of a population, um, they project themselves as just speaking the truth and common sense that seems to appeal to certain segments. and. As my colleague here, Professor March, said, the silent majority might not even be the majority. Mm -hmm. um, Pippa Norris and Richard Ronald Engelhart have actually pointed out that those who vote for so-called strong men tend to be of a certain generation. There's a generational gap. That the older the generation, the more likely they're going to turn to um, more conservative values, the idea of nostalgia appeals much more so that the idea that back in the day when things were good, 
you know, people respected their elders and politicians were noble. Um, and a return to this idea. So they're not actually the majority in Western Europe. We've got an aging population, but they are a population that votes. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the voting population. Um, the younger generation is very active in online um, protests, um, maybe demonstrating for Me Too youth movements, but they don't translate that political action into voting. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a charisma, but a really skillful use of understanding which audience they want to talk to and translating that in a common sense language that defies the normal political civilised language of politics. Mm. No, that's a good point. Um, before we go to the audience, I'd like to go around the, the panel uh, asking, is there an antidote to the strongman? If, you know, how, how, how can conventional mainstream liberal politics and democracy protect itself and proof itself from strongman politics? Or is, or, or is, or is this now... Is this now politics? You know, is this is this is is this not a blip? This is this is politics as we know it now. You're looking at me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm thinking of. Um, I think things go in cycles. I don't think it's inevitable, but there is a trend, and um, I think that there's been degradation of democracy worldwide over the last 20 years. Um, I was looking at something from Freedom House, which is an American institution that measures democracy and I, it's something like 20% of the world now lives in countries which are completely free and in 2005 I think it was 46% the number of people who, who live in outright dictatorships is around about 40% is stable so it's the ones in the middle that are kind of democratic kind of authoritarian that are kind of prone to slippage and also the, the kind of takeovers of democracy that are um, that happen you, we think of coups sometimes. We think of um, Allende and, um, in Chile and, and things like that. That happens, but actually, I think research shows that it's, it, it's democracy dies slowly and then suddenly. So mm -hmm. it, it, it happens without you knowing it. And uh, Putin's one example, because that, where we are 22 years into his, his office is not necessarily where we thought he was going to be at the beginning. And... Um, he actually came to speak at the Scottish Parliament in 2003, and I took a student visit to, uh, to him. And he, he was charismatic in a way, just answering the previous one. He held a room mm. without notes, and that's, that, you know, for ages. Whether it was true or not, it's different. Um, but but it, happened, it happened slowly, and this is why kind of things that happen uh, with Trump, you know, that's a long period of time. It's why things like Partygate matters. It's not trivial. It's, it's, democracy is about things which are quite precious, which is... Um, and, and quite rare. It's about making sure that the two sides, or sometimes more, respect each other, and it's not winner, winner takes all. Mm -hmm. So that involves compromise, that involves forbearance, so it means I've got some rules, but I'm not necessarily going to take them out on you. If I, mm -hmm. if I, can, if I can impeach the president, I'm not necessarily going to do that. So all of those kind of things are quite precious. And I think there's a lot of work on this, and no one is actually, just, uh, actually really, really quite sure, but it's a, it's a tricky game, because it's kind of from the top and the bottom. It's on the top, it's making sure that democracy works and can work better and that rules are respected and when there is backsliding and things and when there are shortcuts, those things are picked up on and that that is important and, and, and again, should we be worried about it is the title. We've got a lot of things to worry about and maybe in the cost of living we don't think about kind of arcane rules and things but observance of the rules and the spirit of the game is important and we have to protect that because we can end up... And I spoke to a, a, a friend of mine who's... A, who's um, a, um, who's a scholar of the um, far right the other day, and he said, um, and he, he lives in Georgia, and he was like, it's nuts here, and I want to leave. It's, you, you, you do not believe how bad it is where... And he, he, said, he said, for example, he said, my son um, is quite flamboyant. He might be gay. He's nine. I don't know. I don't care. But he's brought up in a, in a situation where people think he shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And the politicians are saying these kind of things, and it's part of the same mm -hmm. thing. So we've got to stop that sliding. But on the other hand, there are issues which are rocking democracies from the bottom. So it's looking at the top and making sure that the mechanisms work. But it's trying to address the kind of things that are causing this resentment. And again, it's, immigration might be a shortcut to other things. But, it, but it's, it's the fact that um, democracies are getting polarised. There's economic um, buffeting. There's the effect of countries like China and Russia in trying to undermine them. 
um, it's the fact of, of um, becoming much more complicated and, and much less able to deliver some of the things that our, um, you know, our, pa our, our parents, our grandparents um, wanted, and particularly for younger people who can't afford things as well. Uh, I remember, again, just since we mentioned the personal note, um, I remember when... I don't remember much about university, which is a good thing. Um, <laughs> but I remember when we left, some, some eminent person, who, whose name I forgot, said, you are the first generation who will not be richer than your parents. This was 1993. We were like in the kind of bathing in the glow of the end of history and the end of communism and things. That doesn't make any sense, but I remember that, and I think he was right. So I think the challenges challenges are harder, but it's about making sure that democracies deliver socioeconomically, but also that the um, institutions function. But was it you said earlier, Luke, that you know you have to be careful about how much you move towards the strong men? Yeah. Now, now, um, I have a question about that because surely you know they are doing something not right but effective. There's an effective modus of yeah. politics that people engage with. Yeah. You know, that they, so they, they, there's, are there not new rules which can be taken and put to the, um, uh, put to the, the service of a liberal democracy you know, in, in this new world, you know, things that we can learn from populists? Um. Well, in terms of learning from their policy yeah, process, um, just the how, they, how they how they how they conduct themselves. Yeah, process. and that goes back to the left. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, opponents and opponents can learn some things from them about what's effective communication and what what uh, drives the media and that kind of thing. And and I think charisma again is is it, there are these personal people who can connect, and it's largely presentation. Mm -hmm. Like in Russia, you have no choice but to uh, to think that Putin is charismatic because there are songs about how you want to marry him, etc. Those kind of things. <laughs> so you, you can work on you can work on effective communications and things. But I think ultimately it's it's about being true to your true to your values, and you mm -hmm. don't compromise on. And it's a longer game, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It includes not necessarily demonising your opponents, but trying to win them over mm -hmm. as well. So even if they are, even if some of that is not going to work, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you won't be able to persuade a lot of Russians that what they're doing is wrong in the short run. It's a, long, mm -hmm. it's a longer game. So, so there's no easy answers on that. But it's 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 about learning some of the some of the the, the media and the leadership texts uh, and taking on those, but finding a way mm -hmm. in which you can integrate them into what you're trying to do anyway. Um, because again. There's, that, there's no way of winning that because the people who support that will, will su support the original rather than yeah, the, the, the person trying to emulate yeah. it every time. Uh -huh. Samantha, antidote to populism in your sphere, in your world. It's hard. Um, I agree absolutely with everything you've said, Luke. Um, there needs to be several pronged actions here. Um, the threat to our liberal democracy really depends on what structure and institutions we have in, uh, in the democratic setting. So strong men can be more dangerous depending on the institutions and structures in which they're playing in. Um, strong men tend to, for instance, try to dismantle checks and balances, particularly in mm -hmm. law and legislation. If those can hold, we have some hope. And there was, particularly within the legislation, they have to push back because in certain circumstances, law and the legislature are becoming a weapon and an instrument of executive power rather than justice. So we have to ensure those institutions and structures remain effective checks and balances. We also need to, as Luke said, actually attack and resolve some of the genuine grievances and articulate where those problems have happened in a more intellectual and robust way, rather than just finding scapegoats. Um, for instance, middle class Americans, white middle class Americans, have lost out. They are nowhere near in the position that they were, say, 20, 30 years ago. One of my favourite kind of little anecdotes is if you look at the movie Robocop that was in the 1980s and their description of what Detroit would look like in the future was it would be terrible and it would be down, oh, downrodden. If you look at the film in the 1980s and look at Detroit today, Detroit is worse than the film actually depicted. You know, manufacturing has been desecrated, but not because of Muslims, feminists, and gays, but because of neoliberal globalization. We need to like actually focus on what the problem is to find the correct solution. And that's gonna find time. And for that, we need engaged, educated, critically-minded people. And that critical mind is actually being dissolved with the use of social media, um, and mainstream media. 
you know, we've Try not to get all your news from, you know, Fox or CNN. You know, by all means, have a look at those things, but also have a look at a range of different ideas. Um, and this kind of comes back to what Luke was saying about compromise. Sometimes people say the, the very definition of politics is compromise. Who gets what, when and how? It isn't just political parties, because I'm kind of with you. I'm not interested in political parties. Mm -hmm. It's kind of boring politics. Politics is everywhere. It's in the power relations between us, the fact that we're sitting on a stage and you're down there. You know, all of this is politics. And it needs, we need to come back to this idea of compromise, of listening to each other and critically engaging. Because critically engaging isn't saying that we hate you. It's about making things better and raising ideas that perhaps not understood or even thought about. There's a reason why in the UK we talk about the loyal opposition because it's needed, it makes it better. I also think what we understand as the strong man needs to be critiqued. I don't think it's very strong to isolate yourself and pretend you and you alone can solve these problems um, and then start criticizing any critics as enemies of the people, whether they be academics, journalists, or political opponents. It creates a, a lesser, political environment and it's dangerous mm -hmm. so we need education we need critical thinkers we need strong and robust institutions and structures and we need to understand as a populace that progress is not unilinear there was particularly at the 1990s and Fukuyama's end of history narrative that progress was one way that once you made achievements that you couldn't go back we can't be complacent this is rubbish of course there are ebbs and flows and tides where sometimes progress is made and sometimes there's backlashes. Or alternatively, if Norris and Inglehart were right that the silent majority is actually a minority and is propelled by the baby booner generation, maybe we'll be fine, we'll just wait for them to die. <laughs> <laughs> cohort theory, a lot depends on cohort theory. Peter, antidotes, and then we'll go to the audience. I think a lot of that's been covered, but I would say one antidote, the famous line, events, dear boy, events. The, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic didn't dif differentiate between authoritarian regimes and democratic regimes. And you, we can see now that the Chinese government uh, is having trouble with its approach to managing COVID. And uh, I think COVID contributed to bringing, bringing down Donald Trump. I did think it, it's damaged, it badly damaged Boris Johnson by, by revealing that he was uh, not enforcing the rules he imposed on the rest of society. And it did, I think, bring down Bolsonaro in mm. Brazil. Mm. So reality, tends to be unforgiving, but it sometimes takes time. But there is hope. I mean, I was and am pleasantly surprised at, so far, how well the rules-based order has held up in the face of the Russian challenge and the invasion of Ukraine. It may not last. There's an, a crisis coming in most European uh, societies over the price of energy. But if it can hold, then it's a sign that democracy may be a little more robust than it seems mm. to us at the moment. That's really interesting. Okay, so we've got about half an hour left, which is your time. Um, I would, uh, just, how are we going to do this? There's a, a young lady with a microphone at the back. If, if, you, if I call you to speak, if you wait for the microphone to come to you, say your first name um, and... It, please ask your question. Now, the questions I would most welcome are ones where you think we're talking rubbish, okay? <laughs> or we've, we've, we've missed out obvious things, or our perception is, is flawed in very obvious ways, and, uh, or, or areas that you think just we haven't covered that are, that are important. So, so feel free to uh, let Lee be unleashed. My panelists, I'm going, to say, I'm, going to take, I'm going to take a couple of, two or three questions at one time, and then my panelists, can pick up anything they want from 
I'm not, you don't have to answer everything that's, that's there, but you can pick up something that you want to talk. So uh, we'll start right at the very front here with this lady here in this body dress. What's your name, madam? My name is Anne. You spoke very briefly only about the Middle East, but I wonder if you'd like to offer your comments on MBS. Mm. Sorry, what's your name? Oh, Anne, sorry. yeah. Uh, MBS. Oh, MBS, yeah. And there's a chap here as well. We're, 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 we're going to go, we're going to go. Yeah. Uh, uh, Martin. Martin. Uh, so I'll, um, uh, I'm trying to remember my question. <laughs> All right, don't worry. <laughs> Shall we? Yeah, yeah, uh, um, locust ideology, is that a threat to democracy because of the way it's uh, exploited by populists and strongmen? So it's what, sorry? Say it. Popul uh, wokist, uh, wokism. All oh, right, right, okay, yeah. yeah. And seeing as we're doing the front row, we'll have this chap, ginger chap in there. Sorry. Redhead. Uh, so I'm Ewan. Uh, my question was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the field of mimetic warfare, um, but what, how would you view the relevance of that in relation to the growing power of like, Sorry, strong men? Sorry, um, the f How important is the field of mimetic warfare? Mimetic. Or, uh, sort of like, um, you mentioned social media as an influence in the, the political right and CPAC visiting Hungary with Bolsonaro. Um, that would all be sort of defined as memetics and the link uh, across the globe of these sort of social media focused right wing Good. characters. How relevant would you be, or would you view that to the potential yeah. rise of a new right wing or a uh, strongman sort of leader? Thank you. Always good to learn a new word. <laughs> there we are. That's one for today. Every day's a school day. Panelists, pick out something from that. Go to, um, what would you think, Luke? I'd start with wokeism because it's, um, you know, it's become this bugbear for, uh, for some of the people I look at. And to be honest, if it wasn't that, it'd be something else. It's not like it's not like it creates something. It adds it, it, it adds on to a list of already strong grievances. And again, a lot of the people we're talking about in this emphasise some of the things that have been mentioned. It's a, a very strong conservative traditionalist counter reaction. And in Russia, it's enti almost entirely created. It's created by Putin on the basis of an alliance with the Orthodox Church and the army. Um, and it, it, you can pinpoint the moment in which it happened, to about the, around about 2012, to the degree that it's known as the conservative turn. And what, why did Putin do it? It's because he was losing the liberal part of the electorate. And so he made a, he made a switch to go, well, I'm, gonna go, I'm, gonna I'm going to ignore them, uh, repress them, marginalise them. I don't need them. They're, they're, they're not going my way. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of cultivate the traditionalist. And so it's, um, it's the understanding of it. It becomes, it becomes it, in Putin's eyes and in many of these politicians, it's, it's a complete stereotype. And that goes for critical race theory, which there's lots of bans on, on it being taught in schools. And it's not anyway. It's a university subject, as far as I know. Um, so, so it's, uh, and in, in the Russian discourse, Europe is gay roper, no. and it links back to the issue of, um, of gender, gays are effeminate, weak, Russian men, the mujiki, they are strong, they protect their women, um, they might beat them a lot, but that's part of the family, the family's fine, you know, that's, there's, it's, again, it's a, very, it, it's a way of covering up a lot of the issues. Um, how it relates to, I mean, we might have a discussion about what woke is anyway, and it's not... It's, it's a term which, when, at, when it came in, I didn't really understand it. But uh, it seems because it came from, from the US and Americanism. But um, it seems to be a reaction. The reaction against it seems to be about a closure of, of, of kind of um, a way of closing down people from saying what they really mean. But the, the question is, what do you really mean to say? <laughs> you know, and it's sometimes a closure of things that, that maybe, maybe should be addressed in terms of racism, sexism. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that the uni I think the, we're going to see this in Britain because the way things are going, the, the, um, the education secretary may be Kemi Badenoch under Liz Truss, and she has got a war on woke. And it, in universities, it's just the way we do things, and it's just a cultural respect. It's, it's, you know, there are issues with freedom of speech, but I don't know, I speak for other people in the universities, but we... No, we don't, we don't have constraints on academic freedom. Some of our colleagues 
because in my department say some pretty out there things about Russia and Syria, but I, you know, we have to kind of engage with them. So it, it's, it's a, this culture war is a creation, in my view, and it's, it's, it's not really anything to do with the issue as is. Mm -hmm. Peter, what do you want to take from the questions? Oh, uh, I suppose the pneumatic warfare, to me anyhow, this is just a, a technologically updated version of, you know, uh, battles of ideas that are age old. And, you know, we saw the Bolsheviks take advantage of what modern media they could in 1917. And uh, it's whatever's out there. But I think it does, in a way, I'll give me a pretext to eliminate one of my own bugbears, which is this concept of a marketplace of ideas. I hate that term because I think it's insidious. Because rather than ideas being based on evidence and being based on verifiable evidence, uh, Ideas are what's most popular, what you can sell. And that is insidious. And there's a chapter in Mein Kampf, believe it or not, which doesn't use the term, but basically talks about a marketplace of ideas. Tell people uh, something simple, straightforward, something they want to hear. Tell them again and again and again until they forget whether it has anything to do with you know, evidence-based reality or not. And that, I think, is insidious, but the marketplace of ideas has just exploded with the internet. I mean, I remember Al Gore and the information superhighway and it was going to liberate people and set them free, but we didn't think that a lot of the information traveling on the information highway is bollocks. <laughs> you know, and as I, Samantha said, I don't want to misquote you, but we need to equip people with the tools to weigh evidence, you know, and to be able to say that's persuasive, that isn't because that's based on evidence and that isn't, and that, that's, that is. And, and if I could just for the moment comment on wokeism, I agree with probably 90% of what Luke said. Uh, I don't think there are any woke ideas uh, to which I object at all but I do object sometimes to the attempt to shut down debate and, re and not to, pers to, to absolve themselves of responsibility to persuade mm -hmm. and just, just label and shut down and cancel. I mean, my daughter is a teenager and she lives in terror of me saying something that gets <laughs> in the media and she'll get canceled. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And that I think is insidious, but it's not really the principles at stake in being woke is just the way it plays out in, you know, in about sowing division and vilifying and, and that I object to. But as far as, you know, people of different sexualities, gen transgender, whatever, I just want everyone to, to have love and be happy, mm -hmm. you know, but, I'm, but the way to convince everyone else, maybe everyone in this room, that that's the way forward isn't by shouting them down and labeling them as kind of retrograde monsters. Mm -hmm. It's about exposing them to reality. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. What do you think, Samantha? <laughs> I mean, do you want to pick up the MBS thing or? or yes, I will. It was I was targeting yes. you and I skipped it. <laughs> <laughs> it was on, yes, the um, asked question. Yes, yes thank you. Um, yes, Saudi Arabia is interesting because obviously it's not a democracy and doesn't even pretend to be so. With its massive oil reserves and the wealth that comes from that, it has operated on a system for a very long time where it's kind of gone, in exchange for very low taxes, no representation. You know, so there isn't, this isn't a threat to democracy, but it is a threat to human rights and a whole host of other things. What I find interesting about Saudi Arabia is that it is almost manifestly everything we've been talking about. It is, except for anti-Muslim, obviously. It is anti-Shia. It is anti-homosexuality. Um, it is almost projected itself as able-bodied. Um, women are treated in one way, men are treated in another way. But what's really fascinating is that global network with other strong men, particularly, say, Trump. 
um, which feeds into that irony Peter was speaking about, these anti-globalist Jews and global networks. So Saudi Arabia does fit here. It just doesn't really fit into the question about democracy because it doesn't even pretend to be democratic. But it is a horrible example for human rights and minorities and others are really un under threat here. And when the global networks and other strongmen leaders praise Saudi Arabia, then it threatens everyone. So that I, I think that's a really nice example. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah. Uh, more questions, uh, and I'll go from the back. Uh, any people in the back rows? The, uh, the back row are always the most interesting row of any <laughs> audience, because they've usually got a good reason to be in the back row. <laughs> and then it, no, back, no back row hands. Just, ah, you're just fooling yourselves. Chap in the dark shirt there. What's your name, sir? Yes, hello, my name's William. I wanted to ask the panel uh, to what extent it thinks uh, the US and the West in general has been promoting a strongman politician in Ukraine in the face of Zelensky, and what effects that can potentially have on the Ukrainian democracy. Very interesting, thank you. There's a woman there with glasses just here. Hi, uh, my name's Gillian. Um, my question was about uh, age and generation, and particularly the comments that Samantha made about sort of strong men being of a certain age or picking up, um, you know, votes from a certain generation. Um, and particularly, um, if there are any links to the growth of the incel movement online, and that particularly sort of appealing to young men, um, you know, is that these parallel movements that both tap into, you know, the same conception of masculinity, are these the strong men of the future? Um, if you could say a little bit about that, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. And then there's a woman there with the long hair. That's you, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Ellie. So my question's around the future of politics, asking the question of how do we deconstruct our political landscapes and the strong men within them? and bring in key feminist thinkers to use an intersectional approach to tackle this issue and empower younger people to be educated and vote. And I found it really interesting the point around young people protesting but not voting. But is that because young people feel let down and like a vote in a broken democracy is no longer counts and they feel disenfranchised? Right, very good question. Okay, three there. Um, come to you first, Peter. Oh. Uh, what do you want from that? Pick, um, pick something from that. A uh, bowl of cherries. The, 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 I don't, I'm not going to speak about Ukraine because I think there are people here that know more about it than I do, especially the, the pre-February the pre 2022 uh, uh, government in Ukraine. The incel question is an interesting one because I think that there are kind of similar sources of grievance that are tapped into. I agree with that. And I think it's part of, part of a wider picture of uh, uh, you know, this idea that men have been emasculated in Western society, in kind of you know, in uh, liberal, liberal Western society, and that men can't. And it's partly, I think, uh, a part of a wider trend of groups that have, been, have held the whip hand and been dominant in society feeling threatened and feeling that their position is under threat, which is, I think, uh, a dynamic that's very clear, say, in Canada, or especially in the United States, about you know, this idea that pretty soon uh, uh, white, the, the white population in the United States will be a minority. I guess 1946 or something, it's, it's projected to happen, and that there is a sense of, you know, which is a wider sense of uh, you know, people in privileged positions being submerged or overwhelmed and this is a way of fighting back and it you know it allows allows uh, the strong men politics to look to the past and to this past that in most cases never existed that they can recreate I think so they come from similar types of sources you know at, at this wider politics of grievance and of sense of being under threat I think that's a very good one but I'm sorry I didn't understand the very first part of your question about, uh, did you say something about heterosexual or did I miss it? Well, it's like an intersectional. Intersectional. 
Oh, intersectional. Yeah. yeah. Well, I probably would say, from my own perspective, uh, in, the, in the politics of generations, that I don't think people necessarily become more conservative as they get older. Maybe wrong. I seem to be moving more to the left as I get older, but who knows. Uh, however, I do remember being in my 20s and looking at politicians shilling for my vote and think, not recognizing myself or my interests in any of them. And I'm, you know, on Twitter especially, I have a lot of people that I follow or, or follow me who are young and who are very frustrated with the drift towards the center left center in the Labour Party and feel very frustrated by that and, and talk about how could I possibly vote for a, the Labour Party of Keir Steimer when you know, it's no longer a true socialist party. And uh, I don't think this is a new phenomenon. I think this is as old as time. And if there's one lesson of the past 150 years of politics, certainly in democratic regimes, is that the right is much better at putting its differences aside and making coalitions than the left. And the left tends to tear itself apart. And when it does that, okay, it gets further and further away from power. So I'm torn when I see these debates online, you know, uh, on Twitter especially, because on the one hand, I see young people look to the future and they don't see a future that seems just and fair in any of the positions being outlined by today's political parties, certainly. But on the other hand, I see the fact that, you know, Nazi Germany is a great example. Had the left been united in the early 30s, the Nazis wouldn't have got anywhere near power. But instead, the communists, the KPD, turned on the SPD and it was fratricide. And so this is a dilemma facing young people, you know. They voted New Labour finally in 1997 after, and I don't know what's going to happen this time, I really don't. History doesn't tend to repeat itself, but we'll see. Yeah. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Samantha, what do you want to pick up? William, it's a great question, but I'm going to leave it for um, my colleague here to answer. Which one? Which question? Oh, William's question on Zelensky. Oh, sorry, 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 Luke. <laughs> sorry, Luke. That's fine. Gillian, thank you for your question. Where's Gillian again? Sorry? Yeah. yeah, Gillian, thank you for your question on incel, um, which I find very frightening. And I think it's a very interesting question that you you gave, especially because it does seem to subvert the idea of that generational gap. But I think what we have to remember here is that the incel movement is a tiny, tiny portion, although frightening. And it is frightening. Um, I think this has been bolstered by the strong man and the kind of rhetoric, uncivilised political rhetoric that has come out, particularly from people like Trump, who has so many allegations of abuse against women and has, it's recorded, I mean, we can see it. It's in print, it's on television, the kind of comments he has made about women. And I think that bolsters and legitimises the kind of person that will join the incel movement. I also think it has been accelerated through social media that creates these kinds of corridors where you're not, um, oh, you know, you don't expose yourself to critique and to investigation from an opposite side. So I think incel has been really helped by social media's insulating. Um, but it's also part of a deeper problem we have about talking about what masculinity is. There's a variety of different masculinities out there. And the kind of traditional strong man, I am the protector, I am decisive, I am violent, has been undermined. Right? That's not how most of us uh, understand our men. Most men are just as fragile, just as caring, just as sensitive as women. But what we fail to do is actually project an, a positive alternative masculinity for people. And without that alternative, I think certain, certain men who don't know how to negotiate their masculinity end up falling back. So I think it's part of, a again, an a larger debate that we need to be having. But thank you for your question. And um, the intersectional approach, I've forgotten your name, I'm so sorry. 
Ellie. Ellie. Thank you. I love intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw is great. For those of you who don't know what intersectionality is, it's the idea that it's not just one part of our identity, but the mixture of all of our identities. We're not one thing. We're not just a woman or just a man. We're also a particular ethnic group. We can be a mother and a daughter and a variety of different things at the same time. Our class matters. You put them all together and then you get an idea. So that's intersectionality and thank you so much. Um, and I think when you're talking about that, that generational divide, I think, yeah, young people have been let down, but really let down. I was a generation before you guys and we were told that we've got the end of history. We've got, we've managed it, we've made it. All we have to do now is manage the situation, which left you with nothing to do. You know, this is it. And it's been disappointing. When young people have voted, the results have not been what they have voted for. Whether that be the referendum on the EU, whether that be voting for the Liberal Democrats, so your student fees are rise, you've been let down over and over again. I understand why young people are maybe not going to the ballot box because it has failed. And the idea of democracy is just not as appealing as it used to be. We have, you know, legislature deadlock. We have a tax on the capital. It's not doing the job that we thought it would. But I think young people still have to keep going because if you don't, then we will end up with the kind of nostalgic, outright racist, misogynist, homophobic kind of leaders. So you've got to just keep going. <laughs> yeah, sorry, suck it up. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. And um, the hot potato is passed to, 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 to Luke. Yes. Um, if I'm paraphrasing your, your, your question properly, William, it's basically that Zelensky is projecting himself as a strong man. Is that right? Well, to what extent? To what extent is Zelensky? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a fascinating question. It deserves a long, long answer, which I won't give. That said, all the other questions were great. And I'm what harder for me, so I'm, glad I'm, I'm actually <laughs> glad I'm dealing with this one. Um, he is, he, he, he's, he's a great war leader and he's presented as a kind of hero domestically and not just by the States, but think of the way Boris Johnson used him for his own popularity <laughs> numerous times. Um, now, one of my students, I did a course on populism, the essay at the end was they, they could write themselves, and one of my students said, I'd like to write an essay about Zelensky as a populist, and I'm like, okay, fine, go for it. I'm not that convinced but go for it. And they did a good job, and I, I was convinced by the end of it. Um, he's a great communicator. He's got a lot of charisma, and a lot of it's derived from his, you know, he's an actor and a comedian. He, he can play the TV. If anyone wants to see how good he can be, you can go on, on YouTube and you can look at Vladimir Putin's um, May the 9th Victory Day speech, which is tired old cliches. No, it's just roll out the tanks. Know, here, all the kind of stuff about the great patriotic war that means a lot to the older generation but is now kind of hollow. Uh, and Zelensky does two of them, and he does one dedicated to the memory of the Second World War, and he kind of reinterprets it as a kind of and said, uh, about Ukraine's part in it. And then he, does, he says we're going to have another victory day, which is when we beat you. Um, so, so he's a very clever politician. He is not a, the, we get the Ukrainian side a lot, and there are dangers in that going forward. Um, they are so much better than the Russians at social media. They're much funnier, they're quicker, they're less cliched and less extremist. The Russians, if you want to see barking mad, offensive stuff, look at the Russian embassy in London for a start. You know, genocidal, frightening stuff. Um, so we've got to be aware of how that tilts our point of view. And there will be questions to be asked, and there should be questions to be asked about how the Ukrainians are conducting the war. And already some Ukrainian generals are saying, why was the South not dependent? You know, this, these kind of things that should be asked in a democratic society. Um, and what I would say, again, so, so the, and also Zelensky has said, and this is likely, he said, whatever happens, we will be a militarised society. We might be a bit democracy, but like, um, like Israel, in terms of very, very, very careful about our borders, very aware of defence, those kind of things. And I think, you know, that's the best case scenario in, in many respects. Loads of people have gone to sign up, women, men, doctors, academics, you know, if I was there, I'd, you know, I, if I was in the country, I'd have to, you know, I'd really no, no choice about it, although I'm probably too old, but even then. 
Um, even that, so, so it's a very militarized society and very invested now because of the atrocities they've suffered in, um, in defending themselves. And that has some dangers going forward. What I, would, what I would say is there are two things. Traditionally, Ukraine has been much more democratic than Russia, and part of that has been structural because it's been balancing between different regions and, diff and Russians and um, different languages, different regional identity. And some of that may go, because, depending on where the borders end up, but they might lose a lot of the, Russia, the, the East. We hope, you'd hope not, but they, may, they, they will end up as more <coughs> homogenous. But there is something in Ukrainian political culture which, again, Ukrainians aren't Russians, um, and this is, this is something that Vladimir Putin has never picked up on. But their attitude to government is different. And, as, and what we're finding out now, and particularly people like me who mainly studied Russia, is there's a whole history of Ukrainian resistance. And they've brought down their own governments numerous times. Um, and their whole attitude to power, just, just while I'll end on, in Russia, it's the vlast. It's the kind of thing you worship. In Ukrainian, vlada, is the, rem uh, the, rem the word, doesn't mean the same thing at all. It doesn't have this sense of worship of power. So there's much more a sense of the seeds of a dem democratic society. And what I would hope is if, if at some point Zelensky exceeded his brief, they'd do what they've done to the previous leaders and vote him out, which you can't do in Russia. Thank you very much. We're almost at the very end, I'm afraid we've got time, no more time for questions, but what I'm going to ask is each member of the panellists very briefly to identify something that we should all be looking out for or wary of, an event, a person, a trend, something that in the context of our discussion is something that's going to be, be on our horizons as we move forward from today. And uh, I'm going to spring it on Peter first. <laughs> That, that for me, uh, for me in any democracy, the independence of the legal system, the, judi the judiciary, and the, the police is absolutely crucial. Yeah. That's where it starts, always. The first thing the Nazis did was the Enabling Act. Mm. And that allowed them to dismantle everything else in Dominic Weimar Rav. Germany. Dominic Raab. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. No, no, I mean, no, there are threats now. I mean, yeah. more than we've seen. But nothing like as what's going on in in other parts of the world, but that's, the, for me, the first yeah. trigger. Good. Samantha. I agree. So I'm going to take it much more to grassroots and what we all can be doing. And I would say, rather than shutting down those thoughts we don't agree with, engage with them. Mm -hmm. Ask people, why do you think that and what evidence? Mm -hmm. And just allow a safe space so we can start a conversation and maybe get that compromise. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Yeah, related to what I said and about how democracy dies slowly, and it's a similar thing, defending values. We should we be worried about the, the, the death of democracy? We've got a lot of things to worry about, but it's, it's one of the biggest, biggest things that, despite economics, all of those kind of things, values, compromise, trust, legal system, openness, all of these things are what makes democracy work, and the strong men try to shut them down. So we defend them with our lives, kind of. Hopefully not, but that's ultimately what it, what it comes down to. Thank you, Luke. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our uh, discussion today. I've learned a lot from it. I feel I'm far more uh, able to look at this um, key issue of the moment with uh, a little bit of subtlety and uh, uh, a few grace notes of thought in there. So I'm grateful to our panel. I'm grateful to you for your very good questions. Could you please show your appreciation for the panel? Thank you. <laughs>